<laughs> Amen. You got your Bibles. I'm just playing. Jump to your feet. Grab your Bibles. We're going to the Gospel of St. John or the Gospel according to John. We're going to go to chapter 1, verse 29, and then we're going to flip a few pages to chapter 19, verse 5. I'm reading out of the New King James Version this morning. And this is just a culminating message series that is bringing us to Easter that we've entitled Behold. And by the way, Easter is next week, right? Easter is next week. I'm telling you, it is a huge opportunity to see hundreds of people come to know Jesus next week, right? Everybody knows you go to hell if you don't go to, go to church on Easter. Everybody knows that. Hey, people are going to come next week who normally don't come to church during the year. And we have great opportunity to have audience with them. And so we're expanding our footprint, if you will. We're breaking out of the normal. We're throwing a net instead of a fishing with a pole. And what that looks like is we're going to have like the first ever Saturday night service as well next week. Saturday night, right? Five o'clock on Saturday night. It will be the same service as our Sunday services will be. The same message that we're going to preach on Easter Sunday. We're going to preach on Saturday night at five o'clock. And then we won't have an eight o'clock. We're going to move it back next week, just so you're catching this, to 730. So we're going to have a service at 730. Then we're going to have another service at what? What time? Nine. I need to figure it out, right? 1030 and noon. So we have four experiences on Sunday and one on Saturday night. So we're just making room for God to do some great things. Amen? Amen. So just so you know that, praise the Lord. If you're able to come to that Saturday night, please do. If you, uh, as you're here at this 8 o'clock, please come to the 730. And the reason why I'm encouraging you to do that is because a lot of people are going to get up and choose to come to that 9 or 1030 service. And we want to create some space in those services to have audience with those people that are going to go to church just because it's mama. And mama going to make sure we go to church on Easter Sunday. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody have a mama back in the day that made you go to church on Easter? Yeah, come on, somebody. Some of you. The rest of you are going to get saved today. Anyway, John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. It's been our text throughout this series that we've entitled Behold. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, behold, say behold. Behold the Lamb of God who, here's a really strong word, takes away the sin of the world. I love that word takes. We'll talk a little more about that today, but it means to lay siege to, to rip apart, to take ownership of, to lead away. It's powerful. John chapter 19, verse five. John 19, verse five, again, reading out of the New King James Version. It says, then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said to them, behold the man, behold the man. The lamb was actually a man. The lamb is a man. I said, the lamb is a man and the man is Christ Jesus, amen. Behold the man that is gonna take away all the sins of the world. Father, thank you. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for your word today. And thank you for hearing ears and hearts that are hungry and desiring to grow in our faith. You said faith comes by hearing. Today, God, I just speak an explosion of faith in the hearts of your people today. Rip away from us doubt, unbelief, uncertainty, skepticism, Cynicism, God, rip it from our hearts and let our hearts of faith be firmly established today. I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 As you get in your seat, tell somebody, say, It's for the whole world. It's for the whole world. Praise God. This has been one of my favorite series to teach and preach to you over the last several weeks. Um, I tell you, I, I have learned so much as I have navigated each of these messages. So I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to learn as well. Matter of fact, I just, I, I accumulate so many notes through these studies that it becomes, what should I take away? It, it's like you can just keep drilling down on each of these messages and probably pull them apart and, and pull three or four messages out of them that would stand independently, if you will, but yet cohesively with this purpose and intention of God for the Lord to be so intentional with us is, for me, reinforcing my adoration for him, 
reading through the scriptures and seeing such detailed emphasis and intentionality to communicate to us his plans and purposes just causes me to be awestruck by his brilliance. Again, I say to you oftentimes, the 66 books we call the Holy Bible is one amazing compilation given to us by God through 40 different authors over 1,500 years who didn't sit around a table and collaborate on what they thought they should say, but holy men of old were moved by the Holy Spirit and penned these words that I believe is God's intention to reveal himself, his plan, his purpose, and eternity for all of us. And what an amazing roadmap we get to pull off our shelves or to open up on our phones and read and let it instruct and guide our lives, right? The word of the Lord is a lamplight unto our feet and a light unto our path. It, it just shines the way forward. It helps us discern our environment and figure out that sometimes when we feel like we're going down, that really we're going up. Some, sometimes when we feel like we're being overtaken, we know that we're more than conquerors. Sometimes when situations doesn't appear that they're working out for advantage, we got that word that says all things are going to work together for the good. Sometimes when the enemy looks like he's coming in like a flood, you just can trust the Lord that he's going to lift up a standard against him. I mean, that word just encourages us and helps us in every aspect in life. It does. Helps us with the faith in our family, the righteousness of a father, the righteousness of a mother. 1 Corinthians 7 will sanctify the whole house. So my kids may be acting crazy, but pretty soon they're going to be acting crazy for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? There's something always at work that is constantly breathing hope into the temporary and helping me grab hold of the eternal. The, 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 the longer I serve Jesus, the more I understand personally of the power of sacrifice. Not, his sacrifice in and of itself is overwhelming. In this season, I feel a great sense of gratitude sitting on the body of Christ where we're maybe leaving off this sense of I need, I want, do for me, do this, Jesus, to a sense of God, you have been so good to us. Uh, right? Anybody been assessing lately and thought, man, I am not where I used to be. I'm not hung up on what used to hang me up. I'm not tied down on what used to hold me down. But you just feel a, a, a sense of progress. Can I encourage you, if you've not been sensing that, to take a break? Yeah. Jensen Franklin calls it, take a praise break, right? And stop and just reflect just a minute and remember where you were and assess where you are. Yeah, it may not be where you want to be, but you're not done yet. The, the work is not over yet. The half has not yet been told yet. Your eye hadn't seen all of it yet. Your ear hadn't come into the hearing range of all the wonderful things that God has and planned and purpose for your life. Are you with me? His sacrifice for me creates a great sense of gratitude in this season. And I say it in this season because sometimes we're selfish, right? Because there's also a level of sacrifice that you have to give to him. Present yourself a living sacrifice. There's reciprocation, right? There, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that acceptable, perfect, and good will of God. After all, is that not your reasonable service? In, in Romans 12, there's this sense of, you know what, God's done so much for you. There's reciprocity coming as you surrender yourself a living sacrifice and your mindset changes. Now you begin to demonstrate your gratitude and thankfulness in your sacrifice. Anybody ever sacrificed something from the Lord? Amen. It could be saying no to her and yes to your wife. That's a sacrifice for some. It could be speaking up and owning the truth when it would have been easier to lie. That can be a sacrifice. It could be going home when you wanted to stay out late. That could be a sacrifice. It could be turning off the computer and not looking at naked people. That could be a sacrifice. Are you hearing me? There's all kinds of ways that, that we are worshiping God and showing gratitude and expression. And then there's the sacrifice that we have for each other. The sacrifice that you have in your family and you for your family. I hear a lot of, a lot of people say, and I think there's, there's balance to it, that I'm doing this for the sake of my family. I think the older you get, the truer that becomes. I, I, I do. When you're young, you're pretty ambitious. Well, I'm doing this for my family. You're 20. You're doing it for you. But when, <laughs> but when you get 50, it's like, what am I leaving behind? All of a sudden, things start to change. I, I, I told my son on the, on the day that he had uh, gotten married, I, you know, I'm looking for something important to say, and the uh, talk of intimacy was passed, right? He was graduating college, and we had already had that talk, and it was more corrective. Yeah. And any, well. anyway, 
I, I, I said, Lord, what, what, what can I say that's meaningful and that's right and that's true? And, and this come to my heart and spirit that there's a place that a man gets to when what he's leaving behind is more important than what he's chasing. And the long, younger in life that you find that place, the more impact in life that you will actually have, right? Because when you sacrifice, you are demonstrating the highest level of love that you can possibly demonstrate. I say all the time, love is not what pleasures you. True, the true essence and the definition of love, no matter what culture is trying to do to it, is sacrifice. Sacrifice is the expression of godly love. And we get to do that for each other and with each other week in and week out. The sacrifice is that God is the initiator of it. God is the initiator of this wonderful thing that we call sacrifice. And it looks negative. And sometimes it, it, it doesn't always look as beneficial as compared to what the cost is. But Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, leads us to a little bit of intention with the word sacrifice, where it says, also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. The, the purpose, let me give you this, the purpose, write this down, the purpose of sacrifice is for the, pur- is for the purpose of drawing near to God. Amen. That's the reason for sacrifice. Sacrifice at its root is for the opportunity for humanity to draw close to God. Matter of fact, an interesting word in the Hebrew, if you will, is called korban. Korban in, in, in the Hebrew. And it's a word oftentimes used for sacrifice. The word korban means to draw near. It, it means to come near. It's for the purpose of offering something that gives proximity and so God has rewarded us with sacrifice, but sacrifice's purpose is woven into the desire of God for us to be close, to be near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, he sacrificed, he corbined his only begotten son. He gave him as a gift for the purpose of proximity, for the purpose of nearness. And that's what sacrifice does. It closes the gap because it's expressing this deep sense of love and it's putting a value system on it. And when I think about the love that God has, that he gave his only son, what kind of values is he communicating to you today? I mean, seriously, what kind of value is God aiming at you through Corbin, through the Corbin of Christ, through the sacrifice of Christ, that he would give him up for you? I could understand him keeping him and throwing me away. I certainly can understand him throwing you away. I mean, you know, I'm just a little holier than you, so I can understand that, but I'm joking. But but, no, no, maybe I'm joking. But that kind of love is mesmerizing and sometimes past finding out. The idea of God's sacrifice, whether it's an animal or agriculture, is not about killing something, but it's a deliberate act of God for the purpose of nearness. Man, if that shouldn't provoke gratitude out of our lives, man, what else does? If the thought of God God giving his son for the purpose of proximity with you doesn't provoke desire out of you, let, let me just say this, you don't love anybody, nobody loves you to that extent. To that extent, to that extent, I can even measure it like this. You say, well, my wife loves me like that. Stop reciprocating. Let your behavior be without boundaries. Find out how that'll go for you. Something will turn. Something will change. But the love of God, while you were at your worst, while you was yet a sinner, he still, he, he gave that. Relationships that we have are based on reciprocity. There's this give and take. You can sometimes even see it, not always, but sometimes even see it in the way that we care give for people that are in the stages of passing. There's this, uh, uh, there's this level of faith that rises up and believe for restoration and healing oftentimes as we walk with people through sickness. But there comes a time when there's no reciprocity in the relationship and it's just pulling from me. And it can get very tiring and very draining. It doesn't make you bad. It's just part of how our humanity functions. We need response to what we're sowing. We need gratitude for the efforts. And when you're not able to get that on the level of what you feel the sacrifice is, it can be very frustrating. And so I've watched oftentimes language change as people processes, process through things like that where they'll move from this sense of faith, hope, get up, God's going to do, to Lord, let your will be done. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you're going to give them peace. 
And in essence, they're looking for peace in the person that's suffering, absolutely. But also they're looking for a little peace themselves. They're, 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 because the pressure of that care can just compound itself over and over again. I have great admiration and great respect for people that are able to endure through the transition of life of their loved ones. It's not an easy task. It's, it's, it's a huge task, again, because oftentimes you don't get the reward of response out of the relationship or the context of the relationship has changed so dramatically. I wept sitting with a couple not long ago in the counseling room as they had been married for decades and now he is struggling with dementia and she's sitting in a room and he doesn't know her. And just the heartache and the and, 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 the, and the pain of those kinds of things. Now I'm doing what I've always done for you, but yet you're looking at me like a stranger. Man, I tell you, if you know anybody caring for someone that has dementia or Alzheimer's, you should take a break and carry them a meal, stop by their house and say something to help break up maybe the monotony. Maybe God can use you and I better to fill the gap of reciprocity in their life that helps fuel and give them some courage. That's a good encouragement for somebody right there. That's painful, painful places. So the intention of God has been with sacrifice for the purpose of drawing us near. And so he unfolds it right away in scripture. And he begins this narrative with us to pull us into this deeper place. I, I taught you this, this building of revelation, if you will, this clarity of God's communication that is like a puzzle coming together where he starts with a ram for a man in Genesis chapter 22 verse 13 and 14. It's the place where Abraham lifts up his eyes and looks and the scripture says, and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket. And Abraham went, took the ram, offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said today, in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. God was establishing something by way of experience to bring revelation to an intention that God has through sacrifice. And Abraham is in this mountain. This becomes a marked moment where he names, or let me say it like this, he discovers an attribute about God, concerning God, that previously he did not know. And you and I are beneficiaries of Jehovah Jireh today because Abraham had went to this mountain and got this revelation that in the future, God is gonna do something. Jesus even said it, I think it's in John chapter eight, that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Maybe it's John six. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced to see it. He saw it in this mountain that God was gonna provide himself a lamb. Are you with me? That moves from just a ram for a man to last week we talked about a lamb for a house. Speaking about Passover and the season that we're in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Speaking to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a house. So it was a ram for a man, and now it's a lamb for a house. And through these interactions and through these stories, it's, it, there's revelation that is just embedded, that is overwhelming Amen. For us as believers. But for those people in those times, it was God putting a puzzle together and causing them to restate, um, if you will, the experience for the purpose of keeping revelation alive. So way back when they came out of Israel by the blood of the lamb that was on the doorpost of the heart, God established it generationally as every year at this time, I want you to get your family together and I want you to tell this story. Why? Because he's keeping the revelation of his intention alive among his people. Somebody say amen. So Abraham is unfolding for us one paradigm as a ram for a man. He's saying in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. He's pointing us to Jerusalem. He's pointing us to the mountains of Moriah. And in Exodus, here we go again. He's saying that blood is going to make a covering for you, if you will. It's going to protect you and it's going to bring you out of the bondage of sin and slavery. And as often as you bring your kids to do, and when they're asking, why are we killing this lamb and why are we putting this blood out? You can tell them that I was once in bondage. Bondage. I was once blind and now I see you might not have known dad and mom back in the day when I was blind But let me know let me tell you I had some blind days and then Jesus came passing by in my life Can I help you understand something you shouldn't hide your story from your kids? You should tell your story to your kids about the grace in God Maybe they don't ascertain all the nuances and maybe it doesn't make all the sense to them But one thing you'll do in the conversation is let them know that it's all because of Jesus. Amen so the revelation has the progression of leading us now from a, ram, from a lamb for a house to a ram for a nation. 
a ram for a nation. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8 and 9, it's a fascinating chapter that has so much prophetic implication given to us as Moses now has led the children of Israel, the entire nation, out into the wilderness and God is communicating to them these laws and these standards that are types and shadows of what spiritual things he is going to accomplish in the earth, which, which would be through Jesus, his son. It said this in verse eight, it says, then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. This is new stuff for the children of Israel. This is brand new stuff. Leviticus 16, 16 goes on to describe for us in this terminology, and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions, for all their sins. Notice that, for all their sin. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Listen, I, for, for the sake of time, I just want to tell you this story out of Exodus, I mean, excuse me, Leviticus chapter 16 that is defined by this. It's called the Day of Atonement. Well, oftentimes you'll hear it referred to as Yom Kippur. It is the most holy day in all of Israel. So God calls the children of Israel, let me paraphrase the story for you. God calls the children of Israel out of Egypt. They get out into the wilderness and then he asks of them an offering. They bring a free will offering to them. He takes their offering and builds a tabernacle. It would become a temple at a later time when it becomes a permanent structure in Jerusalem. And they build this tabernacle with furnishings and services that are according to this pattern that Moses had gotten in this mountain spending 40 days with God. Moses goes up into this mountain, spends 40 days with God. God gives him this incredible revelation of this heavenly tabernacle. He comes back down from the mountain among the nation of Israel, and he says, this is how we're going to worship God. This is how we're going to interact with him. And the purpose that God had laid out is, is I want to be among you. I want to hang out with you. I want to have proximity to you. So the way that they had proximity to God, back to this, Corbin, is through the sacrificial system. It gave them proximity to God, but not full proximity. The writer of Hebrews would tell us that it was just a shadow of things to come. It was signifying a greater place of relationship that we would have in God, but they were walking out the process that is really a spiritual paradigm for how you and I walk it out as well. For instance, in this tabernacle, there was three levels of experience. There was the outer court, the holy place, and what was called the holiest of them all. The holy place is the place where the priest ministered to week in and week out. Every day the priest would go in and minister in what was called this holy place. But there was a huge curtain called this, called a veil that stood between the holy place and the holiest of them all. A real thick curtain, and we're not going to break down colors and different things of the curtain, but it was a real heavy veil. And no one could go inside the holies of holies except the high priest on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement. This one day a year, this high priest had the opportunity to go into this very secret place with God. As a matter of fact, it was where the presence of God would actually dwell. In this holy of holy place, there was a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. It was basically a square box that had poles in it made of acacia uh, uh, wood and overlaid with pure gold representing humanity and divinity together. I believe it represents something concerning Jesus. That's for another time. So you have this box, and in this box you have the law of the covenant. It's called the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Ten Commandments that God gave, right? God gave Moses, wrote on these stone tablets in the mountain. He comes down from the mountain, builds this tabernacle, takes this box, puts the tablets in it. But then God tells him to do something. He says, I want you to put above it mercy seat. The tablets represent judgment, but mercy is always elevated over judgment. That's a good word for somebody right there, right? Mercy, there was called the mercy seat. It was a lid, a gold lid of a beaten work, right? It wasn't made of wood and uh, 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 overlaid with gold. It was of a beaten work. And so you had this gold lid that set on the box. It was called the mercy seat. The, the, The mercy seat is actually... We call it the, the day of, uh, of atonement. The word atonement is kapar in, in Hebrew. It, it, it means to appease. It means to make covering. The mercy seat is, is the root word of atonement. It's kapareth, maybe. It's kapareth, something like that. 
Uh, I, I don't have that guttural Hebrew voice, right? It, it's kapareth, and kapareth is what the mercy seat is called because it's the place where covering would come. Man, that's like really, really good stuff. And so here's what would happen on the Day of Atonement. The high priest would have to get a bull. I'm going to skip that part of the story because he'd have to reckon with his own sin and his own life and make atonement for himself. So he was in position, being sinless in the eyes of God, if you will, in order to intercede on behalf of the nation of Israel. But God told him, I want you to go and I want you to find two goats. I want you to get two goats. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to bring them goats to the door of the tabernacle and you're going to cast lots for them. In some ways, we might say you're going to roll dice for them. They would have two rocks and on one rock, it would say for the Lord. And on the other rock, it would say for Azazel. Azazel means to be sent off or to go away. There's a lot of conversation out of the book of Enoch about Azazel, but it actually means in its roots to be sent away. So he said, you're going to cast these lots and you're going to put one in one hand and one in the other. And the lot in your right hand is going to be for the Lord and the lot in your left hand is going to be for Azazel. And so what happened, they cast the lots, the priest would get them. And then the ram that was for the Lord was the ram that was going to be sacrificed that day. It was going to be offered as the atonement offering for the children of Israel. The other ram was called the scapegoat. And so what was going to happen with the scapegoat is the scapegoat was going to be released into the wilderness after a ceremony procession concerning it. So they would take the scapegoat at that point and they would tie the scapegoat to the door of the tabernacle. They would actually tie it or bind him with a scarlet thread. A lot of history on that, unbiblical history or it's extra biblical history. We won't break that down, but it's a great study for anybody that wants to dig into that. So they would tie that scapegoat to the, horn, uh, to the door of the tabernacle with a scarlet thread. Then the high priest would take the, the, the goat that was for the nation to make atonement for the nation. He would kill that goat. He would take that, the blood of that goat and he would carry it into the Holy of Holies, into this place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where this mercy seat was, where God had told the children of Israel, I will commune with you there. I will speak with you there. When you read the Old Testament about the glory of God falling on the tabernacle, it, 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 this is the place where God came. His presence came. You can read it in Exodus chapter 40 when Moses set all the furnishings of the tabernacle in order. Then the glory of God came and it dwelled above those cherubims. And this is the place where Moses and God would have this interaction and God would speak to him. Let me, let me fast forward. He would take that blood, he would carry it into that holy place, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat seven times. Seven times. That's actually pretty significant because this is a picture of Jesus himself who is going to be wounded in seven places himself and laid in what I call the holy of holies, which is the grave. In the earth, the holy of holies is the grave. You remember I told you about the mercy seat being this, this, this lid, and on each end of the lid, there's this, these cherubims, these angels that were stretched out with their wings over the mercy seat. You remember that? And so what had happened, he would go in between those, those, those cherubs and he would sprinkle the blood seven times. It's a picture of Jesus when he is laid in the tomb with his seven wounds, his two hands, his two feet, his side, his brow, and his back. He had seven wounds and they took that seven wounded body and they laid it on a slab in a tomb. And you remember the, the day of the resurrection, we'll talk more about that next week, that when they, they run down to the tomb, the stone had been rolled away. That's a type of veil that that, that was holding us hostage in death, hell, and the grave. That stone was rolled away and John and James run in. And you know what the Bible says? They saw an angel sitting at the head and an angel sitting at the feet. Because Jesus now, as our high priest, had went into the holy place, if you will, and reconciled, paid the debt, made atonement, made a covering. That's good preaching if you don't understand it or not. For you and, and, and I. They would, and, and so they would take that, and then here's what had happened. Here's what had happened. They would, they would take that, that, uh, that goat, and they, they would not take the goat and put him on the brazen altar. They carried the goat, here's what the scripture says, outside the camp. They carried the goat outside the camp. Most all the sacrifices would happen at the tabernacle on the brazen altar. But the scapegoat and the red heifer, we could talk about that at a later time, those was dealt with outside the camp and hence Jesus when he's on trial guess what they do they carry him outside the camp where you can't make this stuff up are are you with me 
And so they would carry that goat outside the camp and they would offer that goat as a burnt offering. And this was called the atonement for all the sins of Israel. Back to the scapegoat. So after that happened, he would come back. He, the high priest, would come back to the scapegoat. And at this point, here's what he would do. He would take his hands and he would lay his hands on this scapegoat and he would confess the sins of all the nation of Israel. He would confess their sins and he would put, it was as if he's putting all the sin on the scapegoat. Then the, then the Bible said this, and he would give it to a fit man. Anybody been coming to our prayer on Tuesday night? Listen, the Lord's been ministering to that about fit men. He would, put, he would give this goat into the hands of a fit man who would carry this goat out into the wilderness and primarily throw him off the edge of, the, of a cliff so that the goat could never return. Are you with me? So that the goat could never return. This is, this is a wonderful picture here. You remember when Jesus was, was, was arrested and beated, beaten, beaten, and now they're going to bring him out and behold the man and make a presentation before uh, uh, of Israel, right? So here comes Jesus. Come, come up here, Pastor Shane. Come up here, Pastor Tommy. We'll let the dark-skinned guy be Jesus. He looks more <laughs> Eastern. You look like a Barabbas. <laughs> so Pilate has come up and he's saying, behold the man. Behold the man. The lamb had became a man. And he's saying, behold the man. And he begins to say to the people, he said, listen, it's a custom for us to release a prisoner at this time of year. Barabbas had been in jail because Barabbas had, been, had murdered a, a Roman. And now he's in jail awaiting execution, right? And so it's the custom at the feast to let one go. And so here's Pilate before the Jewish nation, and in essence, what it looks like is he's casting lots. It's like he has two to choose from. And the people start screaming, crucify him, crucify him. It's as if they're making the choice because one is gonna die and one is gonna go free. One is gonna die, one, one, one is gonna bear the weight of the sin. I used to think that Barabbas was a picture of the scapegoat because it would look like here God looking down and making a choice between his son and this son. But that's not the case at all. Jesus represents both the goat that dies and the goat that bears the weight of the sin. And so that day, here, here's what the scripture says, the sins of us all were laid upon him. So the crowd says, this is the one that is gonna bear the weight of the sin and that is gonna die for the nation. But what about this guy? This guy is a picture of every person in this room and every person that has ever lived. Barabbas, that's right. If we could give you a spiritual name, it would be Barabbas. You're thinking, ooh, I don't like that name. Well, it seems nefarious, doesn't it? It seems to be associated with murder and anything but righteousness. But God is intentional. Barabbas, Bar, it's made up of two parts, Bar, son of, Abbas, Abba. He actually represents the son of the father. And here the son of God is being chosen to bear the weight of the world while the sons of the God are being freed. It, it's really a picture of Jesus taking, here you go, not only making atonement, covering you. Remember back in the garden and God made them coats of skin? He's bringing that thing full circle. I'll drive it home in a minute. He's bringing that thing back to full circle because in the garden, before man fell, there was fellowship and communion that happened in the cool of the day when the voice of the Lord would walk in the garden. And that's what God is trying to recover and recapture in humanity. And so God lays the sin, the sin, on, on him and he sends him out. And you know what the scripture says? It, he, they, that, 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 that they sent the scapegoat out with a fit man. You remember when Jesus is thrust out to the city? The, the fit man means a man that is caught by occasion. It's not talking about being fit and strong. It, it means a man of opportunity. That's what a fit man means in, in the Hebrew. It means a man of opportunity because when they're sending the goat out, he has to have an escort. He's called Simon from Cyrene. And Jesus, under the weight 
and the burden of the cross, all of a sudden God sent a fit man named Simon who comes alongside of him to carry him. This was the assignment of the fit man, to carry him to his death, to make sure that he reached the destination of death because it would be a bad omen if you just carried him out in the wilderness, the goat speaking, and that goat made its way back to the city as if your sins are returned. No, it was the job of the fit man to make sure that you got the goat, the scapegoat, to the place of death where he was certain not to return. Why? Because God was saying to you and I, I am taking your sins from you and I am casting them as far as the east to the west. I'm not only making atonement for you, but I am removing, behold, the Lamb of God that sees us and takes away the sin of the world and cast it far as the east is to the west. He said, and I, in Hebrews, will remember your sin and iniquity no more.